Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, August 2nd, 2020. This is Lesson 9 uh, from our In Our Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, as well as our Standard Commentary. And we are in Unit 3, which is entitled Faith and Wisdom in James, that is the Epistle of James. From the Adult Quarterly, the lesson title is Ask for It. Ask for It. Our devotional scripture is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 8. Background scripture, James chapter 1, verses 11, I'm sorry, 1 to 11, which is also our printed passage or lesson text. The aims of the Adult quarterly lesson or number one, consider the relationship between wisdom <clears throat> and perseverance through trials. Number two, affirm the value of trials and hardships in making one a wiser and more productive disciple. And number three, pray for godly wisdom by which to endure life's trials and temptations. And our key verse is James chapter 1, verse 5, which reads, If any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Uh, from the... Uh, from the new, from the NIV, the New International Version, that abradeth not is translated without finding fault. Without finding fault. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been in a series of lessons uh, involving wisdom, and we are speaking specifically about godly wisdom. And over the next uh, few weeks, uh, we are going to be taking lessons or studying, if you will, uh, the book of James and the lessons on wisdom we can draw from it. A little background on James. But before I do that, let me uh, also mention um, uh, the title of the standard commentary lesson, which is Faith and Wisdom. Faith and Wisdom and Additional Aims. Or number one, identify double-mindedness as a hindrance to receiving wisdom from God. Number two, explain the connection between lacking wisdom and being double-minded and unstable. That comes from James chapter 1, verse 8. And then number three, write a prayer requesting God's wisdom while confessing the sin of of double-mindedness that hinders receiving such wisdom. Double-mindedness hinders our receiving an answer to our prayer in the form of wisdom that we request. Uh, the outline from the standard commentary has three divisions, three major divisions. The first is one, enduring trials. The second is seeking wisdom and the third is handling wealth. And going back to the adult quarterly, uh, it has three divisions as well. The first is joy in our trials. That's covered between James chapter 1, verses 1 and 4. The second is ask God for wisdom. It's covered between chapter 1, verses 5 and 8. And the third is the problem of the rich. That's covered between chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. I was about to give a little background on James. James the man, first of all. And then we'll speak a little bit about James the epistle or James the letter. James, uh, it is uh, <clears throat> commonly understood that the man who actually wrote this epistle was the half-brother of Jesus. And uh, while during Jesus' life, 
uh, James did not believe in Jesus or believe he was the Messiah or the Christ. And we can see that in uh, John chapter 7, the Gospel of John chapter 7, uh, verses 3 through 7. Uh, actually, in verse um, uh, 5 there, it says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. We know, however, that after James witnesses the risen Christ, uh, he becomes a believer, a faithful believer, and bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, where in, in verse 7, where James is named among the apostles, uh, when uh, Paul is uh, explaining uh, the gospel and the number of witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, verse 7 said, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So James became uh, not only a faithful believer in Christ, but also uh, a leader uh, at the in the church at Jerusalem, which was the mother church uh, in the first century. Uh, we know that James uh, rendered uh, a decision, uh, the... Uh, decision, if you will, um, during the uh, uh, what, what was called the Jerusalem Council. Uh, we can read about that in Acts 15, verses 13 to 21, uh, where Jesus, I mean, where the apostles, anyway, uh, got into a dispute about what was required to uh, become a Christian, uh, that they they actually uh, needed to clarify for those um, Gentiles who were becoming believers that circumcision uh, nor keeping of the Jewish ceremonial law was required. And James, of course, uh, spoke to that in, uh, again, Acts chapter 15, verses 13 to 21. Uh, and this was around 51 uh, A.D., uh, the Now, concerning the epistle of James, the letter was written by him, uh, and uh, it was written to, as we'll see in a minute, the diaspora or the scattered, the Jews that were scattered beyond Judea, okay? Not only those within Judea, but the, the, what, what, the Greek rendering of scattered, the word scattered is the diaspora. Uh, and uh, this was including the remnant of those that made up the northern kingdom. We know that only Benjamin and Judah made up the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. And and so and it's it's believed that this epistle was written around 52 A.D. Uh, we know from accounts from Josephus, the first century uh, Jewish historian, that James was. Uh, was brought before the new proconsul, uh, uh, I'm sorry, procurator, I'm sorry, uh, procurator, um, and accused by the, the high priests and Jewish leaders of, of, uh, of sedition. This was uh, by the high priest and the Sanhedrin, and he was actually sentenced to death and executed as a martyr in AD 62. Now, let's uh, let's uh, read our first passage, and we'll get into our lesson text. But before we do, let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, we so need your wisdom. We so need godly wisdom, Lord. And and Lord, help us not to be double-minded or doubtful about your desire to give us wisdom in abundance, Lord. Wisdom as to how to live in these days, Lord, even these days of pandemic, these days of, 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 of rioting and, 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 and everything that's calamity, Lord, everything that's going on in our lives as a nation cities and states, but also in our personal lives, Lord, through the personal trials that we endure. We thank you, Lord, that we have this great privilege to come before you 
knowing that you know everything about our needs, Lord, and that you're so willing to provide for all of our needs, Lord, even your godly wisdom. We, we ask your blessings upon all those who will hear. We ask that you'd help us to understand what we hear. We ask that you'd increase our faith and our obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first passage, uh, first division, if you will, of the adult quarterly lesson, again, is entitled Joy in Our Trials, verses 1 to 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. Now, um, <clears throat> backing up to verse 1, uh, James says, he, he introduces himself, he gives the standard introduction, James uh, a servant or bond servant. This is not a uh, an employee, if you will. Uh, this is a bond servant, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, a God rather first, and then the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, he that means he is uh, he belongs to holy. Uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not introduce himself as the brother of the or half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and certainly um, you can understand why he does not. Certainly he does not regard that as significant. Number one, and then doesn't want to um, to give any um, appearance that he's trying to leverage. Uh, his status for power. Okay, so he's just another servant of the Lord Jesus, a bond servant of the Lord, of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part A. Part B of one is to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Now, this is again, a, this is a formal greeting, a formal letter. And he is addressed it to the 12 tribes of Israel. And we have to believe he means the 12 tribes of believers that, of, of Israelites that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly uh, anyone, unbelieving or not, is certainly welcome to the wisdom in this letter, but uh, it's apparent that it was addressed to believers, Jewish believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they're scattered, as if you know your Bible, you know that in, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians captured the northern kingdom, which was made up of ten tribes, all but Judah and Benjamin, and took them captive and dispersed them throughout the Mediterranean world. Uh, some of them found their way back to Judah and other parts of the Mediterranean world, uh, and they came to Jerusalem uh, to worship. That was still the center of worship for faithful believers, for true faithful believers. And so uh, it's likely that he, he reached, again, members of all 12 tribes. Now, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, it was, it, it was not possible to keep the exact records of family uh, of, of, of family trees or lineages, if you will, but uh, it's it's again very possible that he reached some of, some members of each tribe, and uh, he he greets them, of course. And then verse two says, he said, "My brethren," again indicating that they are believers in Christ. He says, "Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation." Now, first of all, let's look at that count. He says count. What does that mean? <clears throat> it implies thoughtful, some thoughtfulness uh, that not only looks at a situation, but looks through it to its potential results. Uh, it means to consider thoughtfully, okay? 
Uh, and he is saying it, what? It joy, joy, which is when you fall into diverse, and we would say diverse, we would add an E to that, diverse and say diverse, or different kinds of temptations. Uh, now, this is, this is kind of oxymoronic. We would think that it's just the opposite. We would not count it joy when we fall into different temptations. And we'll say a word about temptations in a minute. Uh, but he is, he is reversing what would be the common notion, and that would be not to count it joy, but to, to, to count it, to regret it, to, to, to count it something loathsome. Uh, but he's going to explain why uh, he is imploring the Jews, the, the faithful, believe, the believers in Christ, Jewish believers, to consider it joy when they fall. And that's another word. Fall means it, it's something that happens. It isn't something planned. It's something that that happens. And he doesn't say if you fall. He says when you fall, you are going to fall into temptation or temptation is going to, uh, uh, you're going to be uh, confronted with temptation. Now, uh, when we use the word, when uh, the word temptation uh, is translated from the Greek, uh, it takes on meaning based on the context and based on who's doing the temptation. It can mean trial uh, or test. And certainly when God is doing it, it is a trial. It is a test. It is a test of what? Of our faith. It is a test to prove faith, not to God, but to ourselves. And a test to build faith. If we stumble, uh, once we realize uh, we have weaker faith than perhaps we, we thought, then it's an opportunity to build or to increase our faith. Uh, if we if we fail the test altogether, it becomes it can become a temptation of Satan. Satan intends it for for evil, uh, but God intends trials again for good uh, to again demonstrate to us uh, how much or how little faith we have, and to build our faith. Uh, if we go back to Matthew chapter 4, we know Satan tempted the devil. Uh, and it said, if you recall Matthew chapter 4, it said the Spirit, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. Well, what was the Holy Spirit's objective? The Holy Spirit was to prove him, not to uh, himself, or not to God the Father, but to the world who Jesus was and that Jesus was was uh, uh, sinless and would remain sinless even in the midst of great trials and the trial of hunger and, and the heat and so forth. All right, let's move on to verse uh, verse 3. Now, he said, count it joy, all joy, when you fall, when it happens, it's going to happen, into different kinds of temptations or trials. He says, verse 3 says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience or produces patience. Uh, you know, uh, we don't know how much or how little faith we have unless it's tried. Uh, you know, when, uh, when bridges, new bridges are constructed, uh, very often they will have, and let's say it's a bridge with the train tracks running over it, uh, a heavily loaded uh, train uh, pass over that bridge. Uh, and it's not uh, that the architect or structural engineer doesn't have confidence that that bridge will withstand it, but it is to prove it. It is to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that 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 bridge will sustain the weight of that heavily loaded train. So he says, knowing this, that the trying of our faith produces patience. Okay, that's what the trying of our faith produces. And one thing we know you have to have if you have faith 
is patience. I mean, and this, this word translated patience means endurance. It doesn't mean passive endurance, just, you know, just hunkering down and and waiting for the storm to pass. But it means uh, it means uh, being uh, being active and continuing to do the right thing, even in the face of, of opposition. Sometimes when we're tried and we're in deep temptation, we think, well, we can we can cut some corners or we can do this or we can do that because of this trial. But it means to continue to be faithful in our service to God in the midst of the trial. And patience also is synonymous with spiritual maturity. Uh, we know that God doesn't work on our timetable. He works on his timetable. So if God promises us something and he gives us many precious promises in his word, uh, he, he doesn't promise to do everything that we desire, okay? Uh, and certainly those things uh, that we desire that are not consistent with his will. If we go over to James 4, we'll see that, you know, we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, we ask amiss that we may consume it on our lust. God is not is not uh, a genie and not going to grant us everything that we desire, but those things that are consistent with his will. In fact, those things that he's told us to do, like to, to love one another, to have patience, to have more faith, those things that he's promised to give us, he will give us. However, you have to have patience for God to work on his own timetable and not yours. So patience uh, goes hand in hand with spiritual maturity. In fact, it demonstrates spiritual maturity. We're going to say more about maturity a little later here. Verse 4 says, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing or lacking nothing. And from the NIV, that verse reads, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So this word, perfect, let patience have her perfect work. Let it finish its work, uh, if you will, perfectly, that ye may be perfect. We're not talking about the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, sinless perfection. We're talking about maturity. We're talking about uh, a uh, certainly a, a a process of growing uh, in uh, sinlessness, uh, but and growing in our spiritual maturity. And he says, and, and entire means complete, uh, not lacking anything, not lacking any part, not lacking any uh, any good thing that God desires us to have in our character. And in our actions, certainly should be guided by God's godly wisdom. So uh, let's review again. This and, and James deals with three areas in the first, in the opening verses, the opening chapter of his epistle. You know, he deals with, first of all, uh, joy in our trials. That's the title of the first division. He deals with having joy in the midst of your trials or temptations. And then the next is asking God for wisdom. He's, he's going to deal with wisdom. And then we know the third, he deals with wealth, the problem of the rich. So let's move into our second division here, which is, again, ask God for wisdom. We'll read that from the NIV, that passage from verses 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
Okay, now let's let's back up to verse verse five. And let's read that from the NIV this time. And it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously and uh, to all, rather, without finding fault, and it will be given you. God desires to give his wisdom and, and let's 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 back up and let's examine this verse carefully first of all if we lack wisdom well what is wisdom wisdom is is not uh knowledge uh wisdom of course is the ability to use knowledge aright it is discernment it is judgment and where does it come from we're not talking about the wisdom of this world or cunningness or divisiveness uh, uh, of this world or Satan. We're talking about godly wisdom here. Who is the source of godly wisdom? Of course, God is. God gives wisdom. So if we lack godly wisdom, we go to God. We're to go to him and ask. And God is overjoyed to give to us in abundance, generously, wisdom if we seek it. Now, there's a condition on this we'll see in a few minutes on uh, our asking God for this wisdom that he delights to give generously and without finding fault. What does that mean? That means he doesn't call you stupid for not having it. You know, you dummy, you know, what you coming to me asking me for this? No, he doesn't do that. He he delights in giving. He knows our frame. Psalm 103 says it. He knows that we are dust and we don't, we have nothing. We are nothing and we can do nothing apart from God. And certainly God knows that. So he delights to give us wisdom and he is not going to shame us or make us feel uh, foolish for not having it. Uh, now, and it says, it will be given you, okay? If we ask, it will. It doesn't say he may give it to you. It says he will give it to you, but there's a condition on that, okay? Which we're going to see in just a minute. So verse 6 reads, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with winds and tossed. So the condition to getting wisdom from God, which he says he will give us, is that we ask in faith, okay? It says... Um, we, we, we must not doubt. From the NIV, that verse reads, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So we must pray to the Father for wisdom in faith. Okay, and what is that? That means believing what we cannot see, what we do not have. What is what is uh, Hebrews, uh, how does Hebrews 11 define faith? It's the substance of things. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and the substance of things expected. Okay, that word hope means expected or having an expectation for the evidence of things not seen. So we believe, it means when you ask, not only believe that God has it to give, but God desires to give it and that God will give it. And don't doubt that. That's what we're talking about here. When it says uh, the one that doubts is like a wave of the sea, uh, you know how you've all seen uh, sea waves. You've seen lake waves. You've seen pond waves, how they're, they're tossed to and fro uh, by the wind as if they have no control themselves. And they're really torn. In this case, the now we're going to say more, we're going to see more about uh, doubt and double-mindedness. I mean, maybe I'll hold off on speaking about double-mindedness until we get there. But certainly it means waffling. It means uh, not truly trusting God to deliver on what he has promised. And the last verse was a promise. He said he will give it to you. So if we believe God's word and we don't doubt it, 
we will receive it. Now, if we don't believe his word, if we doubt it, we will not receive it. And I often say to people uh, in classes uh, that, you know, everything with God operates by faith. You know, uh, his word is activated by faith. His promises are. You know, when, when he says he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world, that's only uh, activated by your faith. If Satan can convince you that he that is in you, which is the Holy Spirit, is not greater than him in his, in his temptation, you're not going to have that greater power in you. So you have to believe God's word in order to activate the power of of his word. Let's move on to chapter, I'm sorry, verse 7. Verse 7, let's take uh, verse 7 and 8 together here. It says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So why should a person that is doubting the God that he is asking for something, doubting either his ability or his willingness to give him what he's asking for, expect to receive it. I mean, if, if he is not asking, believing, first of all, that is in God's will, and that's important. Secondly, God desire, is able to provide it, and God is willing, or in this case, delights in, desires to provide his children with wisdom. If we doubt that, then we are, uh, we should not expect anything that we're asking for. And verse 8 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And we see that uh, references to double-mindedness uh, elsewhere uh, in the Bible, and and actually allusions to it uh, elsewhere. You know, we know from Deuteronomy chapter five, it speaks of you know we are to uh, that 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 we are to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength with all of our heart, wholeheartedly. Okay, uh, this double mindedness. Uh, suggest that uh, a person is torn between uh, believing in God and in uh, disbelief, okay, or not believing in God, which means he, uh, he is indecisive in terms of his loyalties. He's conflicted uh, between perhaps God and maybe his own ability or, or maybe God and some temptation of Satan, but he is he is uh, not totally devoted to God and not totally confident in God. That's what this double-mindedness suggests. And 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 in a, in a, in a, another sense, uh, and 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 many of us uh, may uh, believe that at times we've been double-minded when you try to to live in two worlds, when you try to. Uh, serve uh, the Lord God, but also uh, appease or um, uh, or uh, not, <laughs> if you will, uh, run counter across uh, grain with the world. You know, try to satisfy some of the expectations or desires of the world. You know, that's that was something that maybe I struggled with as a younger Christian, but but nowadays I. I delight in being the odd person in the group. I mean, I you know, if I'm speaking the truth of God and I'm speaking uh, what I understand uh, his word and will is, then uh, the more um, uh, rebukes I get, the more strange looks, the more you crazy that I get, uh, the more I I, 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 I I know that I'm doing the right thing. I know that I'm doing the right thing. And I run counterculture. And most Christians, faithful Christians, will run counter to this crazy, mixed-up culture, Satan-inspired culture that we're living in today. We want to be uh, wholeheartedly devoted to God. We want to be sold out 
to God. Let's move on to, and, and let me just say one last thing about this. Uh, this instability, uh, we're going to see more about that uh, later as we go through John, uh, uh, James rather. Um, it really causes, it causes people to um, disparage uh, God and to uh, defame him uh, because uh, if they, uh, they're asking for things uh, with doubtful minds that God does not provide for them because of their doubt. Uh, then they become, uh, uh, they, 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 their faith diminishes in God because he hasn't provided what they've asked for in doubt, okay? And of course, they can share that uh, that uh, lack of faith with others. Uh, and, and again, ultimately, it, it, it can cause a person to spiral down in their faith because they've never asked for what God has promised in genuine faith, wholeheartedly, not doubting, without double mind, without a double mind. All right, let's move into now the, uh, uh, the th actually, it is the third division of both commentaries uh, from the quarterly. It is the problem of the rich, the problem of the rich, and from the standard is handling wealth. Verses 9 to 11. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he, is, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withered withereth rather the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways now we're going to back up to verse 9 and we could ask you know what what does this have how does this connect to the prior two passages or divisions how does um, handling wealth of the or the rich uh, and the brother of low degree have anything to do with the trials and the and the wisdom and seeking the wisdom of God? Well, it's again, it's it's kind of a a, a paradox in that uh, uh, what James is uh, proposing here is is just the opposite of what uh, one would normally think. And uh, he said, "Count it joy when you fall into temptations or trials." And here he's saying, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now, what, what does that mean? The brother of low degree is someone that uh, obviously is of meager means, but also humble. This is speaking about a one who is humble uh, uh, as well as poor, okay? Uh, and uh, it's it says that Instead of looking at your poverty or what you don't have, rejoice that they are to uh, rejoice in that they are exalted. And I, we're going to uh, take a look at Matthew chapter 23, uh, verse 12. And there the Lord says, And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased or made low or uh, humiliated, if you will, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So, you know, and, and, and we know that God doesn't choose uh, the powerful and the, and, the, and the rich things of this world, but he chooses those things that are, are low and base uh, to confound uh, those who are powerful. So uh, in God's estimation, the, the 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 humility those who are humble uh or uh, destined to be exalted will be exalted or lifted up uh and those who are high in their own minds and 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 this this wealth that he's talking about we're going to we're going to talk about that in just a minute we're just in verse 9 now so we're talking about the low the brother of low estate from the NIV 
uh, that has rendered believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. So they have a high position with God, despite their standing in the world. That's what we want to understand here. Despite their meager means and their <clears throat> humble circumstances in the world, they have a high standing with God. And if you read throughout the Bible, we know that God used some rich folk. <clears throat> we know that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were all rich and wealthy, and Solomon certainly was. And obviously Solomon was used to a point in his life. Uh, but more often than not, God uses the poor. He uses those who otherwise would be unnoticed by the world had they not been recorded uh, in his word. Verse 10a says, but the rich in that he is made low. So this is a continuation of the thought of verse 9. The brother of low degree shall rejoice in that he is exalted. So the rich is to rejoice in that he is made low. That's that's inferred here. That's implied here that the rich, but the rich in that he is made low. So why would the rich rejoice in being made low? Now, now let, let me let me first uh, back up and explain uh, that uh, this Verse, these verses are not uh, saying that rich, being rich is, is equivalent to being evil or that there's some evilness and richness, <clears throat> but more often than not, the rich are trusting in their riches rather than God. I mean, and, and, and in many cases, many, many cases, certainly in the ancient world and certainly... <laughs> There, there are enough today who get who become rich uh, through uh, harsh and, and sometimes illegal means or abusive means. Uh, you know, there were probably no <clears throat> laws that set wages uh, back in the day. And, 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 and God, of course, gave guidance as to, you know, how to, uh, to have fair scales and how to, to, to treat the poor and so forth, the hireling. But no doubt there were many abuses by the rich of, uh, uh, on those who were against, rather, those who were uh, less powerful, those who were poor. And so uh, he's, as a, as he's speaking in generalities about those who uh, have trusted in their riches. They are exalted because of their riches. And he's saying they should rejoice when they're made low, when they're made humble. OK, uh, before God. OK, that's that's what is being implied here in verse 10a. Uh, we see a, a, a real example of that uh, pompousness, if you will, uh, when it regards uh, uh, Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Uh, we read the passage beginning at 19 uh, through 31. Rich man fared sumptuously. He was clothed in purple and fine linen, you know, and, and he ate uh, sumptuously every day. And he wouldn't, there was a beggar, Lazarus, uh, and the dogs licked this over. Well, you know the story. Uh, but that's the caricature, if you will, of the rich that uh, James is perhaps envisioning here. Uh, those who are pompous, those who are trusting in their riches rather than God. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, it is harder for a rich man uh, to enter the kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle because they're trusting in their riches and they think that they have no need of God because of their riches. Verse 10b and 11. Let's take those together. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flowers thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away <clears throat> in his ways. Now we know we see references to the uh, comparison of, of man and all the glory of man to, uh, to flowers or to grass. Uh, 
elsewhere in the in the Bible, in the Old Testament in particular. Uh, Psalm uh, 90, verses 3 to 6, you can go there when you, when you can. Psalm 103, uh, verse 15 and 16. Uh, and then uh, certainly uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8. We see the flower uh, represents, again, the beauty of uh, uh, all that uh, man uh, has or can attain, if you will. And it's going to pass away. Wealth is temporal. Riches are temporal. There's nothing you have here that you can uh, leave here with. You know, we as believers are told to store up riches in heaven, uh, which don't uh, rust and the, and the cankers can't get to them, canker worms can't get to them, and so forth. How do we do that? We do that by serving the Lord. We do that through our service to God. We store up riches in heaven, but we cannot take anything in this life with us. And we see great manifestations of wealth among uh, uh, in our nation today and in the world today. Um, Rich men create great monuments for themselves. We see how the pyramids even uh, were uh, testimo testimonies or testaments, if you will, to the wealth and power of the, of the ancient pharaohs of Egypt. But those pharaohs are perished in there, and I'm sure every pyramid over there has been ransacked for all the treasures in them. So we know that uh, everything, is, and what he's saying is it doesn't matter how rich or powerful uh, a person is, that wealth is going to perish away, and he is going to perish away as the grass, as the flower of the field, when the sun burns on it. So I think in this last passage, what James is trying to do, he's going to say more about each of these uh, topics in the three divisions that we discuss today later in his epistle. And I think what he is trying to, um, to demonstrate in this last passage is the futility of trusting in riches. Uh, God uh, uh, delights in a humility, uh, a contrite heart, and that uh, we, we, we cannot come to God in pride. We cannot come to God trusting in anyone or anything but him. And uh, and so that's what he's trying to, uh, to suggest here. He is going to later on <clears throat> speak of the abuses uh, of the rich, how the rich abuse the poor. And that's that still happens today. We know it does. And I, I want to just say a, a, a very brief word about this. However, uh, a lot of people are confused about what social justice means. You know, some advocate for social justice because of the great disparity there is between the rich and the poor. I don't think God any place in the Bible uh, suggests redistributing wealth, obviously by force. The only redistribute, and that's what social justice comes down to ultimately. And there's a lot more that could be said about that. Uh, the only redistribution of wealth God advocates or even commands is that we free will give to the poor. We free will give to those who are less advantaged, okay? Uh, anyway, we're going to leave that where that is. We hope that uh, you've uh, gotten something out of the lesson today. <clears throat> you learned a little more than you did before, and we pray <clears throat> that God will keep you, will keep you safe, will keep your families and your households safe, again, in these uh, perilous times. Uh, and may God bless you and keep you until we meet again.